Today's guest on Sounding Off, you may already know because of his own music theory channel on YouTube. Adam Neely is coming up next. Hey everybody, welcome to Sounding Off. Today our special guest is Adam Neely, YouTube sensation and my new mentor for how to have a music channel. Adam was kind enough to suggest my channel to his viewers. He has a, as of today, 156,000 subscribers to his YouTube channel and it's really the premier music theory YouTube channel on the internet right now. So Adam has been kind enough to be a guest of mine and welcome. Well, thank you, Rick. Uh, it's really to be on your channel. I'm Really excited to be your guest because you've had quite a, an incredible cast of characters, musical characters, and I'm really humble, like humbled to be a part of that. So thank you so much for having me on. <laughs> You're very welcome. Okay, so let's talk about a few things here, Adam. You're 28 years old. You went to Berkeley undergrad. You went to the Manhattan School for your master's in jazz composition. You started your channel about two years ago, correct? Right, yeah. You release a video every Monday. They're a combination of video essays, of Q&As, vlogs, and you have some really interesting different topics that you talk about. For example, your video this past week was on Hockett. But you do videos on musical fractals. You do videos on why classical musicians have terrible time. Actually, it's called How and Why Classical Musicians Feel Rhythm Differently. That's the polite title. I mean, I, honestly, it was, you know, uh, <laughs> why classical musicians uh, suck at timing and you know it's completely unfair and of course like people in the comment section all the classical musicians who are watching this will be like oh my god I can't believe you said that but basically that video and a lot of the subjects that I talk about are things that I've you know talked about with fellow musicians um, you know uh, things that I find interesting things that I find like people may have not have talked about in certain ways on the internet or elsewhere um, now in this, you know, new paradigm of YouTube music education, YouTube and Facebook and social media engagement. And I found that topic kind of interesting, like, um, basically why there's this discrepancy between jazz, rock and pop musicians and how they might internalize and feel time and how classical musicians react to time based upon certain elements in the music that they need to make. And there's definitely a disconnect there between the two, I guess, styles of time, like time field, styles of music making. And, you know, when I made that video, I, I uh, took a fairly polemical tone and I am, I guess I'm taking kind of like a kind of an aggressive tone, like saying classical musicians suck or whatever. Um, you know, back then I was just kind of like throwing things up there. I was like, I'm just going to keep making videos. I'm just going to, you know, like somebody told me you should always be uploading something at some point. I'm just going to keep making things that like interest me. Like these are things that interest me. And so I didn't really quite understand, or I didn't quite, I guess, appreciate how many people would actually watch it and how many people would actually watch it because at a certain point, YouTube decided to say like, hey, uh, people are watching this video, let's start like, uh, let's start recommending it to everybody. And you, you started seeing this one video, this how and why musicians, classical musicians felt music differently. And all of a sudden I started having this platform um, which is, I'm very grateful to have this platform, but, you know, I started having to think about, you know, maybe choosing my words a little bit more carefully uh, than that. So, um, yeah, I mean, this this YouTube thing that I've been doing has been kind of a very much a learning experience for me because, you know, I'm grateful to have the opportunity, but it was, it was in the beginning, it was literally just me throwing up uh, videos that I found like interesting to topics that I found interesting. How do you decide on topics you're going to you're going to discuss on your channel? That's a, uh, a kind of an interesting question because I, I don't, I'm still trying to figure that out for myself, <laughs> honestly. Um, I normally just pick things that I find interesting. Um, and, you know, I, I think the advantage I have, and sometimes people in like tech startup, um, like the tech startup community talk about your unfair competitive advantage, which makes your company or your brand better than other but other people's. And, you know, I don't normally think about this, but I think the advantage that I have is that I have a wide array of interests uh, in a variety of different things beyond just plain music, trying to make connections between history and philosophy and, you know, cognitive science and a lot of different other, other things that will relate to music, um, you know, and trying to also to take a look at, you know, how different sorts of people like music, musical styles will relate. And the way that I do it and organize my thoughts is I just have a, a you know, on my phone, I just, am, as I'm walking and going throughout the day, if I think about something or think about some connection between something like 
you know, in this Hockett video that just came out, like the connection between electronic dance music and 13th century, uh, like Hockett techniques of how the different uh, lines would inter interweave. It was like, oh, that's kind of an interesting thought. And so maybe one day as I'm like on the subway or whatever, going to a gig or whatever, uh, I'll be like, I'll write that down. And so just over time, I, I put together, I like get these like nuggets. I just organize them around these ideas. And the thing that I've been finding, you know, more and more recently is, um, people react very well to connections, basically how, um, if you try and take something that might not on the surface will look like something else, if you're able to like make it seem that everything is just interwoven into like, like a unique whole, um, people will feel a lot more inspired by like a particular aspect of music that they, you know, connect to, but now that they see something else, how it's related to all these other things, um, in music related, like in music and art in general, uh, you know, I think people get really excited about that. And, you know, that's part of the fun thing about doing the channel is making those connections. So you live in Manhattan. Yep. Where are you from originally? Because you live in New York City. Yeah. So um, I live, basically, I was born and grew up in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland, a uh, suburb of Washington, D.C., which uh, has, you know, a fairly good, fairly uh, happening jazz scene unto itself, but fairly conservative jazz scene. And, you know, I, I liked it, but at the same time, I, you know, I needed to, at some point, make the move to New York City to find my fortune as a jazz musician, <laughs> which is what a lot of people end up doing, just moving, because you need you need to, as uh, Dave Liebman says, and study under Dave Liebman at Manhattan School of Music, you have to spend at least five years in New York to say that you tried to make it as a jazz musician. Otherwise, you, you know, you, you haven't done it. I'm not sure if I necessarily believe it, but you know that I took that advice to heart, and I have stuck around for a little bit more than five years. So <laughs> that's where I am. Tell me a little bit more about where you come from conceptually with your bass playing. Who are your influences? You're an electric bass player. Did you ever play upright bass before? So you know, I've, I've played upright bass a little bit throughout this whole process of me like studying and being a musician, and whatever. Um, it's been primarily electric bass. I mean, some. Huge influences early on, or of course, uh, Victor Wooten was a big, not only musical uh, influence, but just, you know, a, a, as an edu educator and as a human being, you know, uh, you know, very much in inspired by Victor Wooten. Um, in terms of like musically, like the people that have like really checked out, um, Square Pusher, uh, for sure, for electronic music and how ba bass playing, you know, um, can be put into uh, electronic music. Uh, Thundercat is a more contemporary example, and also there's a good friend of mine, uh, Evan Marion, um, who is a uh, another local New York City bass player. He's just an incredible bass player, but he's also just the way that he approaches um, taking the electric bass guitar and putting it into a new paradigm of electronic music and imp improvised music within electronic music, I think is really inspiring. So there's a lot of different kinds of um, influence influences that I have just as a bass player and, you know, as a, a musician, it's, you know, kind of a disparate o array of things, but definitely, um, yeah, I would say Victor Wooten would be the number one, just the guy that I really, really uh, look up to in a lot of ways. <laughs> okay. What about as far as your musical influences, jazz musicians, mm -hmm. what jazz musicians? Uh, definitely. Um, well, the one that I point to the most out of basically everybody is Charles Mingus and you know, Charles Mingus, there's a, there's many, many things that I can say about Charles Mingus, but uh, he's an incredibly interesting, uh, prolific composer, and also how he plays, how he played bass within his own compositions is really interesting because it's, you know, it's a fundamental rhythmic instrument. It's very fundamental, like um, on the low end, it just provides a, like a root to everything, but at the same time, it's an aggressive solo instrument. In, within his compositions and you can really hear that and it's it's really cool like the uh you know the beginning of better better kid in your soul um like you know Haitian fight song these like bass lines that are just like aggressive and awesome but they're bass lines they're not it's not like this flowery solo sort of soloistic language which can be cool too but you know I, I love that sort of intersection between bass being at the forefront and then like also being a rhythmic instrument and beyond that like as a broader compositional thing one of the things i love about charles mingus is that he basically takes a lot of the or uh, orchestrational and just uh color coloristic elements of duke ellington's writing and duke ellington's like um st uh, like just conception of what the jazz orchestra is and he's able to uh, basically translate this into a much more like 
ex like this explosion of uh, timbre and uh, color and sound and blues. And it's just this great, like, um, it's this great thing. I just love Charles Mingus so much from a, like a compositional standpoint. Um, you know, more like when I moved to New York and when I had my training in, you know, Manhattan School of Music and all that stuff, I was thinking I was going to be a jazz composer, whatever that means. Um, I was going to like maybe make a living off of like uh, uh, commissions and like publishing things with high school and college bands and like have my own big band, I guess, because that's a small, there's a small and very vibrant like niche in New York City of big band composers and large jazz ensembles, pretty amazing, ma amazing things. I was very influenced by my teacher at Manhattan School of Music, Jim McNeely. Give a little background on Jim for people. He is a uh, jazz composer. He played with Stan Getz's band for a while, uh, played with Phil Woods, a uh, piano player, uh, yeah. plays with a Vanguard orchestra, but he got his training with the Thad Jones Mel Lewis orchestra and very much of that lineage. But, you know, he's taken it to this, taken it, you know, turned it up to 11, the same way that Charles Mingus turned Duke Ellington up to 11, Jim McNeely turned Thad Jones and a lot of this other big band, these modern big band writers up to 11. Um, and, you know, he... <laughs> He had, there's one of my favorite like idea, like stories or things that he tells is there's this kind of infamous concert at Carnegie Hall um, with Dave Liebman where they uh, did this premiere of Jim's rearrangement, recomposition of Sing, Sing, Sing. And it caused, you know, it wasn't a riot like the Rite of Spring, but it definitely caused a sensation because of how incredibly dissonant and out and how intense the harmony was and the counterpoint and everything. And people were thinking like, oh, it's Sing, 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 like, you know, Glenn Miller or... Benny, Benny Goodman's like big band sort of thing. And, you know, they're playing at Carnegie Hall. So it's a very like up, the kind of stiff crowd. And now like, I think this is in the early nineties sometime. Anyway, Jim McNeely is like a uh, huge hero of mine. And, you know, I don't talk, unfortunately I don't talk about what he, uh, his music on my channel is maybe I probably want to or should, but um, in terms of composers, definitely I, I really dig what McNeely has done. <laughs> Have you done a lot of big band composing yourself yeah i've done a little bit you know the logistics of running a big band of course are difficult yeah forget it i i uh envy everybody who has uh, envy and don't envy anybody who has that drive to like or organize that and make that a thing that they perform with um i uh, had a commission a couple years ago for this uh multimedia event at this place called roulette in brooklyn and i had a big band and we did this thing and there's this stuff on my channel of this big band uh, that i put together yeah like the concept was electronic big band so um you know we were playing to a backing track essentially which was kind of crazy we had and the reason why we were playing to a backing track is because there was this uh, big video presentation that was like being projected on this hundred foot screen behind us as we were doing it um, which was really cool. It was like a fun sort of experiment to see if like I could take a lot of this electronic language that, you know, I've been working on just for myself because, you know, I'm, um, you know, uh, that's definitely like the language of today's music is how to incorporate electronic sounds into jazz music or into live performance. So we were doing that. We had like, uh, the, half the saxophone section were on e -wees. We had like drum pads. It was, it was this whole, whole thing. So I've done, I've done some of that stuff. Um, I've been, it's been less and less of a focus for me recently. And the reason why it's been less and less of a focus is basically because I've had this YouTube channel. And I realized that, Hey, I can communicate with people. I can communicate these ideas that I've been having, like, you know, uh, musical fractals or whatever. I can communicate these ideas in a much more direct way rather than having to organize this whole big band thing, which I can do this on a musical level. It's a grand musical experiment, but at the same time, you know, I can do this week after week. I can engage with people on some of these things a little bit more directly and be able to express some of these ideas I've been having um, in this even more modern sort of format. So I, I really like You need that. to explain musical fractals. For my viewers here, Adam has a whole episode on this, but give the general gist of it. Okay, so this is, this is mm, it's kind of hard to do, to break this down, super simple, but basically the idea behind this, it's kind of almost a musical magical, it's magic show or whatever what you can do is you can take a melody and you can organize the sound of this melody like through a synthesizer in such a way that when you slow it down to like a thousand times slower than what it was you start hearing the melody again 
And it's it's kind of hard to really describe exactly what uh, what this is without going into all of the math behind it. But basically, it comes down to organizing uh, mathematical relationships of time, how fast certain notes have to be uh, basically beating. So, you know, one of the things I talk a fair amount on my channel and I talk I mean, a lot uh, more about is the idea of perception. So like, um, you know, on a, a physical fundamental level, music is just like, or sounds, pitches are just uh, measure, measurements of how fast something is happening, measurements of rhythm. So when we talk about A equals 440, Basically, what that means is that A is the sound of something happening 440 times per second. So if I was to just be clapping that fast, I physically can, and I was able to clap 444 times per second, that would be A, essentially. And a lot of music, uh, just a lot of music is based upon the relationships of how fast things occur in Time. And basically, it just comes down to our perception of how fast things occur in time. So this musical fractals idea was just kind of, uh, it's almost just an experiment that somebody um, somebody suggested on Reddit, actually. And they were like, uh, if you could like take something, take like, uh, and in my musical fractals uh, video, I take the first four bars of uh, Smash Mouth's All Star. Um, basically what happens is I take those first four bars and I play them at a variety of speeds. So maybe the first note of Smash Mouth's All-Star, like I take that clip, maybe that plays at like 400 times per second. And then I play it slightly faster, like maybe at 600 times per second. And then I basically come up with all the different individual mathematical ratios um, to describe how everything might like relate back to one another and how it actually all comes together. So it, it's an interesting thing. It's not particularly practical. But what I'm doing with the musical fractals videos, I'm trying to show something fundamental about the nature of the, uh, acoustics, about the nature of sound, that it's all essentially rhythm. How many things, how many times things happen per second? And you know, um, a lot of people on my videos will say, and like just in the comment section, just say mind blown because they haven't been exposed to this idea. Now, the, uh, a lot of scientists have, a lot of acousticians will. Have, this will be kind of like. Um, E this is e easy to them. This is this uh, material that I'm sort of providing on the channel. This is like, oh, this is obvious, like whatever. But one of the fundamental things about musicians is they're not exposed to a lot of these ideas. They're not exposed to the idea that, you know, sound and acoustics physically, all it is is just how fast something goes. And, you know, there's some cool musical illusions that you can use, like musical fractals, to prove that point. Um, you need to watch the video, though. Definitely, definitely watch the video. Um, but I think part of the fun of it is like is actually experiencing, and I, I you know I, I can't um, you know, I don't have my whole audio visual setup right now. But I think part of the fun of it is experiencing. You slowly hear the melody slow down, and as you hear the melody slow down, eventually you hear like, oh, it's the melody again, except now it's a thousand times slower, but you're still hearing the melody. Explain to me what grapheme synesthesia, is that what it is? Yeah, so this goes, goes back into the idea of like perception. How different people like understand what they're, they're hearing, because you know, we might be listening to the same music, but fundamentally we might be like, um, we might experience it differently. And synesthesia, for those of you who don't know what synesthesia is, it's basically a uh, crossing of the senses, involuntary crossing of the senses is kind of the scientific technical um, definition of it. So when somebody, uh, I have something called grapheme, uh, grapheme color synesthesia, which is a very mild form of synesthesia, which basically means I have involuntary uh, associations between musical pitches, days of the week, and uh, letters and sometimes numbers with color. And when I say it's involuntary, it means it's something that I don't even have to think about. It's just like, oh, it's obvious. So for me, C is yellow, D is kind of this uh, like bluish sort of thing, E is purple, um, F is green, G is brown, A is red, B is this purplish black. That's just what it is. Those are what those things are. And I was trying to think when I was talking to you uh, the other, uh, like last night, I was trying to think of like the best way of describing how this is. I think I figured out a pretty cool way of okay. describing this. Basically, so say you take a black and white photo of like a farm, like just a, a rural, like pastoral, like scene, a black and white photo of like a farmland. It's nice and whatever. And so you, when you're looking at this black and white photo, you might not think at all about what color it should be. It's just kind of like, you could think about it like, oh, 
when the color is turned on on this photo, that green or that grass is probably going to be green, but it's like something that you don't even, you're not really thinking about. It's sure. just a black and white. And the same thing for me, like if I'm looking at a score of music, um, you know, if I, I'm looking at all the notes, I'm not necessarily like thinking like what the color should be. I know what they would be if they, the color was turned on, but you're not really thinking about that. So if say you take that photo of the pastoral farmland and you turn the color on, but the colors are all wrong, like the sky is orange and the grass is like purple or something like that, you'd be like, this is wrong. I mean, I, I know what it is, I know, but you know, like all that stuff. And the same sort of thing is if I'm looking at the score and all of a sudden the colors were turned on and C were somehow green, I'd be like, that makes no sense. C's not green. What are you talking about? <laughs> the, so that's essentially wait, what Wait, wait, what, what color is C to you? Is it red? Uh, yellow. Yellow. Okay. And the interesting thing is people with synesthesia there's no rat, like there's no correlation and it's different for everybody. And there's some science to suggest that uh, early on in the brain's development, there's something that happens be when somebody is learning colors or something like that. Like maybe, maybe it was like a baby book that I saw. That I've, I've seen things where, where uh, magnets on the refrigerators, they think it could possibly be the letters when they have the alphabet on there that certain color the kids will associate letters with. And it, it could be that, and it, it's involunt It's like it's went very early on in childhood development. But the thing is, is I don't have perfect pitch. I, you know, relative pitch. I have the musician's equivalent of that, so it doesn't affect necessarily when I'm listening to music because I can't necessarily tell if that C is in fact a C or maybe it's a D. I don't know because I don't have perfect pitch. But there are people that have something called chromesthesia, which is a much more intense version of synesthesia which um, I have a friend or somebody I know, an acquaintance from Berkeley um, named Caitlin Hova. And she is, a, uh, after she graduated from Berkeley, she became a, a neuroscientist. And she recently did a TED talk about this. And she has chromesthesia where basically uh, when you're, she has perfect pitch also. So when you're listening to things, you experience something called a photism. And a photism is essentially a flash of light or that's how they describe it. I don't know. Like I'm not in the person, I'm not in the body of a person who has chromesthesia, but they describe it as an involuntary flashing of light when they hear music. And so there's a much more deeper crossing between the music and color in a person that has chromesthesia. And she has this whole cool like light show. She has a MIDI violin that, you know, whenever she plays for her, I think C is, C is red for her. So when, yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Cause like, you know, you have the violin and it picks up the MIDI note and then so it triggers like a, a light or whatever and it triggers red. So everybody else around her can hear or can actually see what she's seeing uh, as she's playing the violin. So I think that's kind of a, a cool like, you know, sort of way of maybe approximating it. Um, you know, the, the thing that, you know, I've done a lot of research um, wait, wait, recently. Wait, 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 wait. But you also yeah. said days of the week. Did you say oh, yeah. numbers also? Yeah, occasionally. And for me, it's not as, as interesting or useful because, you know, I'm a musician. I'm not, I mean, I guess for days of the week, Monday's, Monday's green, Tuesday's like light purple, Wednesday's yellow, Thursday's dark purple, Friday's uh, red, Saturday's kind of like this black, Sunday's kind of pink. That's just what it is. And it's, there's no reason, I don't think. And there's no also application, which is the kind of the frustrating thing because it's like, what is the application of that? Well, I don't know. That's just like what it is. And, you know, it comes down to a kind of a, an interesting sort of idea of like uh, perception because you know, we might experience the same sort of music. Um, and, you know, generally speaking, you know, I'm going to experience the sound of music the same way as pretty much anybody else, because I don't have uh, that chromesthesia, that idea that I'm actually seeing things as I'm listening to it. Uh, but I might like study music a little bit differently, I guess. I, I can turn on a, a synesthesia and like I guess maybe I can have these color associations. Scriabin, uh, there, there is uh, in Prometheus, um, there's a, a piece by Scriabin where he, he has this thing called the color organ. Um, he, in, we, we haven't had definition of uh, synesthesia until recently, but um, it, it's, a, it's thought that he had synesthesia because he, he created this whole uh, score to Prometheus, and he had this thing called the color organ, which is supposed to play certain colors at certain times to be associated with certain chords and certain color schema or whatever that he had. And it was very meticulously notated. So at this moment, purple occurs with this, you know, minor seven flat five chord or whatever. Um, 
<laughs> so there's this long history of uh, you know, the relationship of color and music because there has been, you know, for certain people, there's been this very deep relationship to it. Whereas for other people, there might not be as deep of a relationship to it, which is interesting. So like different people might have different relationships to music on a fundamental level. Um, there's something called in philosophy called qualia or qualia. I, I think it's qualia. It's really interesting. Um, it's basically like, you see, like we, we would both agree that this is green, right? That's just like humans would say, look at this. And this is some form of green. Like we could say like seafoam green or whatever, but, um, you know, what green is to you might be red to me. Like I might be looking at this and, you know, just my, my actual sensory experience of this would be red. And uh, there's no way of telling how somebody can actually experience something out in the world without actually like being inside their head. And that's a philosophical concept known as qualia, qualia, Q-U-A-L-I-A, qualia, qualia. I'm not going to say, not going to know exactly how it's pronounced. I'm sure there's going to be somebody down in the comment section that's going to correct me. As there always is, as there always is, which, you know, sometimes can be, sometimes can be great and sometimes it can be quite annoying, but uh, most of the time it's great. Um, and that's something that I always like to think about. You and I talked about this last night about how me being almost 55 and you being 28, when you reach your 50s, your hearing is different than it is in your 20s. That's just a fact of aging and being a musician. I can't hear as high as I could when I was 28. So, so my set, my perception of music is going to be different than yours. Now, the highest note on the piano is 4,195 hertz. The fact that, that maybe I can't hear 15K is not going to be apparent in my ability to hear the note uh, C8, but things like reverb tails and things like that that are up that what? high that you can hear or the top end of cymbals or what people call air, my perception of it is going to be different than yours. Right. And, you know, that speaks very deeply to the idea of the harmonic series because the harmonic series in theory goes infinitely high. And, you know, uh, a lot of people, you would think like basically the harmonic series is all the many overtones of a particular note and the ability to perceive uh, how loud a certain harmonic is versus another one over time uh, is very deeply dependent on your ability to hear very high, high frequencies. So even though technically you might be hearing like, you know, a 10K or whatever like that. Um, if you're able to hear up to 20K, you will, your ability to differentiate um, how, like, the volumes of different harmonics in the 10K region is affected. And, you know, of course, that definitely comes down to hearing loss. And something that I'm finding ver uh, very quickly, because, you know, I, I play loud all the time, like a gig on the weekends all the time. And, you know, I've definitely made the switch to in-ear monitors, which I think uh, is one of the better decisions I've ever made, honestly, because... I can now hear everything that's going on at a reasonable volume, and oh my God, it's great. Um, yeah, so the that's that's kind of a, a really interesting thing is um, you know, and Beethoven essentially went deaf, of course, as everybody knows, but is it still able to write and experience things, uh, experience the music that he wanted to make, um, wrote the Ninth Symphony while he was deaf and everything. But you know, that speaks to the ability that, um, of course, the mind's ability to perceive music in your head versus your ear, which is another interesting like concept. And I've talked about this on my channel. It's called audiation, the ability to hear music vividly in your mind versus uh, just out in the real world and understand it and like in, uh, contextualize it in a way that you can make sense of it. So you could be conceivably completely deaf, but still write great, brilliant, vivid music because Beethoven was able to do that. And um, I, forget, I forget the percussionist's name. Um, there, there's a percussionist that has, did a TED talk who is completely deaf, um, the same way Beethoven did. Oh, man, I'm, I'm gonna kill myself because I can't remember her name. Um, but she get, she's a Scottish percussionist, and she the way that she perceives sound is very much based upon rhythm and how she feels it in her body. So when you're perceiving sound and music uh, like that versus um, you know, it's purely by your ear. There's a bunch of different, even, you know, a, a yet another way that we can work on this perception idea. There's another way that we can experience music and that's in our body, just like physically uh, feeling the vibrations because, you know, scientifically that's all music is, is just um, how many times per second something vibrates and you can feel that in your body versus just your ears. Tell me about having your channel, and I asked you about this, about dealing with people that are trolls, essentially, and, and you'll engage these people. 
Tell me about that. I mean, one of the great slash terrible things about the internet is the fact that everything is anonymous. I mean, it's great because in theory, it would promote uh, free discourse of information. But as you know, we've seen over the past couple of years, that's of course can be very easily co-opted. And so like in the YouTube comment section, you know, I'll, uh, 99% of my comments are, are really awesome. Either like people saying like, hey, I really enjoyed this video or people who like say like, hey, by the way, this thought, which is like, you know, they might make another musical suggestion or they might make helpful corrections like, oh, by the way, uh, for, ex for example, in the latest video, I made, I, for some reason, I talked about Anton Webern's uh, arrangement of the Reichshikar from the Art of Fugue. But in fact, the Reichshikar was from uh, a musical offering. So a lot of people say, by the way, Adam, you made this mistake. And it's like, all right, fine. All right, I made a mistake. But then there is that 1% that just leaves just hilariously terrible comments. And I know of how, how to engage with people like that is to just apologize or to troll them back. It's like this weird, um, you know, it's a, this, you shouldn't feel affected by it. But if you're going to be affected by it, talk their language to them because there's no response that they could ever give back ever unless it was sincere, like a sincere response, like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make that comment or whatever. And that, that has happened. Like, I'll, I'll like troll somebody back and somebody will apologize for trolling. That happens sometimes. But, you know, basically speaking the language of trolls is essentially the only way to do it because then they have nothing, you know, like you are, you're engaging on this level. And, you know, it's, uh, it's just kind of a cheap, petty thing to do. But honestly, like when you, you see this stuff come in, you're only human, you're human, you're, you you put you pour your heart and soul into these videos you're like really trying whatever and then some asshole will say like this is fucking stupid you look you look retarded and i respect that i think i think it's funny <laughs> i mean the alternative is to ignore it but then you know the, for me i'm not like one to ignore certain things and it's an outlet for me to get get out like the energy of like how do i turn this into a positive for myself and sure. like, well troll them right back it's petty but you know i'm human so <laughs> You have a hundred some odd videos out. You get a lot of comments. How often do you respond to comments? I mean, I see you respond to comments, but really how often do you do it? Kind of is too many to respond to all of them. Yeah. Um, do you save things and then use them in your Q and A's? Yeah, I, 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 I save some of the better comments to, uh, especially comments that speak to something that I want to talk about. I'll, I'll do Q and A videos every couple of weeks. I like to use the comments as like a jumping off point to like talk about certain things. You know, a lot of the time people will leave really long comments that aren't questions, so I can't really include them in a Q&A. Like, um, just talking about themselves, talking about their involvement in music, talking about things that they enjoy. And that's fine, and it's great, and I read pretty much all the comments, but in terms of, like, formulating my own, like, responses to things, um, you know, part of the fun thing about YouTube is that I can engage with people. And, you know, I, I make an, a real concerted effort to engage as much as I possibly can. Um, it, because it, it's, you know, it's fun and it makes, honestly, it's better for my channel that I have people that are dedicated and invested. And then so I try and invest back in people who leave comments who are, feel like they're genuinely like they got something out of my videos or genuinely inspired by my videos in the same way that I might be inspired by a really awesome musical performance or really awesome like thing like, you know, my heroes or whatever, my musical heroes. So I try and make my, myself as available as much as I can. But sometimes, uh, you know, there, there is like this uh, weird, um, like how much time do I have to dedicate to this? And I, uh, unfortunately, I just can't respond to everything just by the nature of the fact that, you know, I have to live my own life too and to keep making videos and keep being a musician. But um, that is, it's a great thing and also kind of a stressful thing about the fact that uh, I'm like YouTube makes, you know, connecting with people so easy. Where do you see your channel going? What do you want to do with it? Where do you want to take it? Oh yeah. Well, I have visions, and I'm not sure the re how realistic this is because the channel did grow very quickly, um, which I'm very happy for. Uh, how quickly the channel grew! Like, you know, this time last year, I had about twenty to thirty thousand subscribers, which was respectable, but at the same time, nowhere near where it is now. Um, you know, I have visions of uh, okay, so like Carl Sagan and like Neil deGrasse Tyson. And Bill Nye, especially Bill Nye, like, like I grew up on Bill Nye, I really did. They're science popularizers. They took scientific concepts and they explained them in very fun and interesting ways to get people inspired by science, to get people excited about these scientific concepts that without them might sound or feel opaque, like feel like they're too complicated or like some mystery 
uh, or boring or dull or something for the average person. And, you know, they might be complicated because it's science and you have to understand a lot of new moving parts in order to like truly appreciate what it is. But at the same time, you can still be inspired to learn more or be inspired or at least have a thought like, uh, this is really cool. I didn't know that about the universe. Now I have some concept of what the universe is. And now my life is bigger because of it. My understanding of the world is bigger because of people like Carl Sagan or Neil deGrasse Tyson or Bill Nye or Michio Kaku is a, another, another person I really dig. Um, so music has had people like that before. Leonard Bernstein with his Norton lectures definitely counts. And you mentioned Glenn Gould also just people who are incredibly eloquent at speaking about music and just make you feel like, Oh my God, this music, like I, I knew I, I hear the music, the music's fine. I, I can hear it, but now I have such a richer understanding of what the music is, what the music means um, because of people like, like Leonard Bernstein and Glenn Gould. Um, and you know, there's other people definitely have spoken about music, but that's kind of uh, a, an eventual goal, like something that I think I'll, I'll be working towards eventually. Is that my uh, goal is just to try and bring in people and get people inspired and to really think and understand the mu about the music that they're listening to. Because you know, most people, especially now, but you know, it's always been the case in some some degree, people might um, listen to music passively, like this is uh, decoration in the background and. Um, something that I've talked about on my channel is the idea of uh, wallpaper music, or for, actually furniture music. Uh, Eric Satie, uh, who's actually another influence of mine, an absurdist Belle Epoque French composer, uh, predecessor of Debussy, uh, a very strange eccentric fellow. He essentially invented this style of music, which he called furniture music. Music just to be like on, in the background, like not like completely inconsequential music. And he was obsessed with the idea of boredom in music, like music that was just like... <clears throat> Um, because at the time, music was supposed to be this grand Wagnerian, like, expressionistic, like, explosion of feelings and emotion. And Satie was like, nah, I don't want to do that. I just want, like, this background nothingness, um, which was revolutionary at the time. But now it's kind of a thing that just is everywhere. Like, music is this faded fabric in the background of our lives and all these public spaces. And it's fine. There's reason for that. And we can understand and understand it like that, the same way that like pop art, uh, like corporate art is in the background, faded in the background. But, you know, I want with the, the death of music, traditional music education, I'm going to not I don't want to say death of, but traditional music education has faded further and further in the background. I want to like have people re-engage with the music that they're listening to on a little bit deeper of a level, at least trying to understand, hey, there is something that these musicians and these uh, people who are creating this music have really thought about. And there's this tradition and lineage of all this music, and this is how it all try comes together. When you listen to music the next time, keep in mind all these things that, you know, maybe I'm talking about on this channel, or maybe other people will talk about on their channels. Keep that in mind. Try and engage with music on a little bit deeper of a level than just this sort of wallpaper in the background. Even though Sati at the time was uh, revolutionary in that idea, you know, it's been sort of co-opted by the Muzak Corporation and, you know, Spotify playlists and all that stuff. Yeah, I think that's that's the that's the direction where I'd like to go with the channel. Where do you see education as far as higher education in music going? I mean, you just finished your degree recently. Is it worth the money yeah. to go to school for music? Oh, yeah, that's out of all the questions. Honestly, that's the question I get asked the most is talking about higher education. Just my opinion on music school in general, especially Berkeley, because Berkeley is incredibly good at promoting itself. And, you know, I, I have, I'm ambivalent about Berkeley, ambivalent, meaning I feel more than one thing at the same time. Ambivalent, by the way, I was using that term for a long time, meaning like I don't care, but that's not what it means. I'm ambivalent, meaning I feel like Berkeley does. There's a lot of great reasons to go to Berkeley, a lot of less than great reasons to go and money, of course, being one of them. Um, yes. So. I'll, I'll break it down like this, and this is what I usually tell tell people: music schools are where the musicians go, essentially. Like that's where people who are going to make a living playing music they will go to music school. Basically, everybody that I know in my age bracket of musicians in New York City and elsewhere went to music school of some variety or another. Usually, Berkeley, uh, at least in New York City, is like Berkeley New School. Occasionally people from, I don't know, Manhattan School of Music, uh, New England Conservatory, and then like smaller schools, City College, uh, Queens College in the New York City area. Basically, everybody went to music school. And because everybody went to music school, there's a network built into everybody who went to music school. So when you're trying to get together with people to play and try and meet people and try and play with people and go and do things, the people that you're playing with are people that you met 
in music school. Um, this has nothing to do with like whether or not music school was worth it or what you learned in music school or anything else than that. It's purely all from where I'm saying, it's the network of people that you met. Now, there's I'm not sure if you've gotten this, but there's this very, very common piece of advice given on the internet, which is like, oh, music school is not worth it. You can save so much money just by taking private lessons with people from the school. Um, I've seen that piece of advice given all the time on the internet since before I went to music school up until now, and that's usually a prevailing piece of advice. But I have never met a single person who has done that, who is a professional <laughs> musician. Yeah. I've never met anybody, and I cannot imagine that happening because uh, when you just take lessons from a person or whatever, you might get some. Of the, you might get some or most of the knowledge, um, but very little of the practical application. Because when you're at school, part of actually most of the the benefit is the fact that you're in this immersive environment with other people who are extremely hungry. People are like, ah, I want music. I want music everywhere. All my life. Let's go jam. Let's make music. And even if it's not very good, it's like you're with people like that. And if you're just going to your private teacher once or twice a week, paying way less money, that's great. You might be getting some of the same knowledge of, you know, chord scales and theory and analysis of tunes and blah, blah, blah. But for me personally, almost all of the benefit of going to school was really the people that I've met because I, you know, I've, um, I've gone to school, like, uh, a lot of the people that I, I went to school with, like I went to school with, uh, uh, Dan Platzman and some of the guys from Imagine Dragons, which was a uh, you know the big pop band or whatever at Berkeley. These are my contemporaries from school, and like they they're great musicians, and they went on to do big amazing things, and are in the beginning of doing big amazing things. Um, and so like that's my my thought process. It's like you want to be in that environment. How do you get in that environment without music school? I don't know. I honestly don't know if it's even possible. I'm not sure if that's economically viable. It might be a bubble that's going to burst pretty spectacularly pretty soon because there's so many people going into music school and there's so little demand for the music that they create. But at the same time, you know, the environment of having this crucible of people like really just excited to make music, that's what the value of music school is. I'm not sure if it's worth the price tag. I really am not. I'll, I'll let you know in, you know, 80 years when I'm done paying my student loans. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and I interviewed Mark Isham last week. He he didn't go to music school, and he's right. that was surprising well, to me. Well, I'm not, I'm not necessarily sure if it's an exception to the rule because this uh, this paradigm of everybody goes to music school is a recent one. I definitely know it's a recent one. First of all, jazz education, such as it is, uh, it's now at, like a, the jazz educational industrial complex, huge amounts of money just within the past ten years um, of. People but but if you look music. historically at jazz musicians, ones that went to college, I mean, a lot of them did go to music school. A lot of the famous jazz musicians did. I mean, some of them dropped out like Miles, you know, but Keith Jarrett went to music school. Herbie went to music school. Well, I, I'll say like they they went for in general, like the difference, I think, is they they went for more traditional classical music um musical degrees and whatever. And then they took that knowledge that they learned in music school and then they applied it to the music that they wanted to make. No, the things you're talking about are really specialized now. The, 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 the types of degrees yeah. that you have are very specialized for jobs that really don't exist anymore. Yeah. I mean, you know, jazz composition degree, like might as well get a philosophy degree. It's just like, it's a piece of paper I can close, play, place on the wall. I'm not going to get a job with it uh, unless I'm teaching jazz composition, thus continuing the, pro the process. Um, <laughs> Which is, you know, uh, I, I will say this, like, there are very, very qualified musicians, people who come out of music school, very, very qualified to do something that maybe there isn't so much of a, of a demand for. Um, but the people that are, see the most success are take kind of, I guess you could take, you could think of it this way. They take this jazz qualification, but then maybe they apply it to other styles of music. There's a unbelievably talented, um, unbelievably talented producer, like electronic music producer I know by the name of Jonathan Stein. He's trained on his undergraduate degree, uh, classical double bass. He has a, a master, or yeah, actually, no, he just has a classical double bass. I went to MSM with him, um, but he makes trap. He makes like this weird trap sort of uh, like electronic hip hop music sort of thing, but he textures it in an incredibly amazing way using contemporary classical music and jazz and he plays seven string electric bass on this stuff and it's this is incredibly textured music but it has nothing to do with the music that he studied in school and that's what i'm seeing so many people um ivan jackson 
uh, is a friend of mine. He's a trumpet player. He plays with this band called Brass Tracks. And the whole idea of Brass Tracks is electronic music, but he layers trumpet on top of it. And he, he worked, uh, he's won a Grammy recently. He went to school with him. He won a Grammy because he produced Chance the Rapper's No Problem. Um, but, you know, these are jazz musicians graduating from jazz school and they're taking their jazz school knowledge and then just... Said, and they're using it in other ways. They're taking their jazz knowledge and using it in pop music or they're using it in EDM or, or hip hop or whatever they're doing. Right. And, you know, and I, I feel like they, um, and one, one of the interesting things, like uh, Jonathan Stein, the producer I, I mentioned, um, he was in an interview that he gave, he said, like, you know, in the, the hip hop or uh, like electronic music community, jazz education is considered, it's mystified. It's like this crazy thing, like, oh, he's classically trained or essentially classically trained, what they would say. So he's kind of put up on a pedestal because he has this training, even though he makes music that might not necessarily be exactly what jazz is, at least in the traditional like jazz session, like playing standards sort of thing. But he has that knowledge and he's able to apply it in much more contemporary context for a, new, a newer style of music that will eventually 30 or 40 years down the line become academized and then put up in this, you know, the academy and then the whole process will start again, just the same way that jazz has been academized. And now rock and hip hop are starting to be academized in, in certain ways, which I find funny, but, you know, that's kind of the, the problem thing um yeah i mean i i think as a whole higher education is worthwhile and i think if you i think the alternative uh, is much more difficult just because it's hard it's very difficult to break into a network because networks can help you rise above um the fact that every, everything is super saturated so having a network to support yourself and support your fellow musicians can be very important but um <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think as a whole, higher education is worth it. Is there anything that you want people to know about you, Adam, that they, that they might not know about you from watching your channel? I play a lot of Roller Coaster Tycoon. <laughs> uh, um, one of the fun things about my channel is, you know, I, I try and give an honest portrayal of like what I'm doing here yeah. in, in, in New York. That's the vlog as aspect of it. You kind of give your give your day to day life and uh, or at least what what, you know, uh, at least a snapshot into that. Yeah, at least it's a curated snapshot. At least should be obvious when people are consuming media, consuming vlog media. And maybe I should say this: like when people are consuming vlogs, it is a heavily edited snapshot of somebody's life. It is, it is the director's cut of somebody's life. Um, so I give the director's cut many times of like gig vlogs. Like I'll, you know, show, uh, do all these things and do my best Casey Neistat impression and like, hey, this is what I was doing today. Um, and you know, I'll. I'll show the best clips from the night or I'll show clips that I'm not embarrassed to show and then maybe edit out the clips that I'm like, mm, I kind of flubbed that note. So I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Which, you know, it might speak to something, uh, you know, kind of fundamental about this new paradigm of like uh, how we consume media and how we consume like uh, just things like this. Like um, uh, we're video and audio or at least this sort of thing. Um, is now a form of communication rather than a form of record. Uh, like, it's not like, uh, for a while it was assumed like when you're filming something, this was the definitive vision of what you were giving out to the world as like, this is, this is it. So if you're filming a mu music video or filming like an in-studio performance, let's make it the best that we possibly can. And there still definitely is that. But now it's a little bit more, it's a little bit cheaper, like because it's so easier to like film sure. and so easy to consume. Uh, it's not as necessary to provide the definitive version and people are a little bit more understanding about the flaws in certain certain ways. Um, maybe not in all ways, but people are a little bit more understanding about the flaws in a person's like playing. Like if they flub a line here, yeah, sure. There's the asshole in the comment section that was like, eh. but at the same time, like if you're constantly showing new work that you're doing, people are going to forget it, you know, a week later. So it's not quite as devastating a thing if something like terrible goes up. Um, now there there is you know the idea of the internet mob and all that, but I don't really don't want to get into that. Um, like, you know, what's internet vengeance is and what, like, all that nonsense uh, means for, like, a video or something. Um, but, yeah, you know, I try, I try and give a, a curated vision of what my life is a little bit, a little bit. Enough, enough to help hopefully inspire people, I think. Yeah. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, Adam, it was a real pleasure having you on. Look forward to, you know, seeing where you go with your channel in the future and really appreciate you doing this today. 
Oh yeah, Rick. Well, thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun and, uh, you know, I can't wait to see what, what other stuff happens for your channel. Cause, uh, I think what you you've done with your channel is pretty awesome. And, you know, the more I can send people your way for people, for people looking to get into like the really in-depth, the good stuff for the music theory, uh, music theory and music, uh, understanding. I, I'm, Really excited to see what you guys you do with your channel. I'd like to thank Adam for being our guest today, and I'll provide the link to Adam's channel in the description below. And also, please subscribe here to my Everything Music YouTube channel and hit the notification button so you'll know when I go live on YouTube. Thanks for watching.